Good morning. Now we have to do it again one more time. Good morning. Good morning, morning Coppin family. Um, I'm excited uh, that you all are here today. I want to uh, welcome our guests, those who are watching online, as well as those who are here at TAWS on our beautiful campus today. The focus today is to celebrate National Criminal Justice Month. And in bringing my welcome, I would be remiss if I did not bring greetings on behalf of our president, Dr. Anthony Jenkins, our provost, Leontay Lewis, as well as the administration, our great faculty, our great staff, as well as our community members. All of those individuals, but most importantly, our students, are the reason the Coppin State University as an eagle continues to soar. As a part of National Criminal Justice Month, we are really excited to have our distinguished guest with us, uh, Ms. Katie Ray Jones, who is helping us launch our kickoff for National Criminal Justice Month by providing a keynote uh, that is entitled Creating Positive Change, Advancing Survivor-Centered Research, Advocacy, and Education. Uh, now, in bringing the occasion, it's important to note that this is an exciting and very busy month, uh, to say the least. Not only is it National Criminal Justice Month, but yesterday we were excited regarding International Women's Day. It is also Women's History Month and Social Worker Month as well. And so we not only acknowledge uh, those policymakers, practitioners, researchers, and students in the field of criminal justice, but we also want to uh, recognize our colleagues and the, our, our friends who work in those other respective uh, areas uh, as well. So at this time, I'd just like to briefly give you a little bit of context regarding this month. I may have the next slide, please. Thank you. So National Criminal Justice Month was established by the United States Congress in 2009. Its purpose is to promote societal awareness around the causes and consequences of crime, as well as strategies for preventing and responding to crime. We're, our, we are a part, and I say we, Team CJ, Department of Criminal Justice, are, are members of the Academy of Criminal Justice Science. The Academy of Criminal Justice Science is the uh, proponent and leader of uh, this event. And the various campuses and communities across the country uh, celebrate this event uh, based upon their guidance uh, and support. And just to give you some additional information, the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences is an international association established in 1963 to foster professional and scholarly activities in the field of criminal justice. The association promotes criminal justice education, research, and policy analysis within the discipline of criminal justice for both educators and practitioners. They provide a forum for disseminating ideas related to issues in research, policy, education, and practice within the field. And ACJS attributes its success in creating this dynamic professional association to the composition of its membership, which is inclusive of faculty such as us, as well as students in Baltimore, but throughout the country. ACJS is comprised of members from a variety of diversified backgrounds, including scholars who are international in scope and multidisciplinary in orientation, professionals from all sectors of the criminal justice system, 
and students seeking to explore the criminal justice field as future scholars or practitioners. This year, the theme for the annual conference at ACJS is Avenues of Change, Integrating Research, Advocacy, and Education. I have been honored to be a part of the uh, National Planning Committee, and our charge to each campus across the country is to consider activities that you can engage in on campus uh, and off campus uh, to promote this exciting month. So as you can see, uh, based on the, uh, the slide behind me, that we have a very ambitious uh, month ahead for Team CJ and criminal justice. Uh, we're kicking it off, of course, today with our distinguished keynote, but we have a series of events from documentary screenings to book readings, uh, highlighting some of the scholarly research of our faculty as well as students. Uh, and so we uh, look forward to uh, campus engagement uh, throughout uh, this month to celebrate these events. At this time, I have the, uh, the honor to transition us to uh, greetings and remarks. Uh, the College of Behavioral Social Sciences Dean, uh, Dr. Beverly O'Brien, uh, I could read her, her bio, but I, I would be here for a while. <laughs> what I will say is that uh, Dr. O'Brien is uh, committed to uh, fostering um, a strong, uh, faculty, development of student scholars, and has a passion uh, and consideration for people. Um, she models uh, what she uh, speaks, and it's, uh, it's an honor to be able to work with her uh, in advancing the mission of our college, but also our university. She is student-centered, uh, and I, you know, we were recently at a uh, on-the-road event and Dean O'Brien was speaking for almost 20 minutes to a young person, just talking about the opportunities here at Coppin State University. And so um, without further ado, uh, to bring some remarks, our Dean, uh, Beverly O'Brien. Thank you, Dr. Rice, and good morning, Eagle Nation. How are you? And welcome to Ms. Katie Ray Jones. Welcome to the Coppin Campus, as we affectionately known as Eagle Nation. We are so happy to have you here this morning. To all of our students, especially those in criminal justice, our faculty and staff, congratulations on your kickoff for your National Criminal Justice Month. This is indeed a very exciting time. You know, the topic of domestic violence, which Ms. Fred Jones will be addressing this morning, is a sad topic. But today, your focus is a very positive one. It's creating positive change around a very negative topic. It's about learning with and from the survivors of domestic violence and advancing the lessons that we have learned into advocacy and education which will hopefully eventually eradicate all those bad behaviors associated with domestic violence. You know, Mayor Scott often says that violence is a public health issue, and clearly it is a public health issue. And Councilman Zeke Cohen said just this past Saturday, downstairs in this very building doing Baltimore's healing health uh, activities that our social work department co-sponsored, that this time is not just a moment in time, rather it is a sustained movement in time for all time. And it's very interesting as Dr. Um, Rice just noted that uh, this is also Social Work Month. And in the College of Behavioral and Social Sciences, if you think that the name of it says Behavioral and Social Sciences, we're all about from criminal justice to psychology to social work to political science, all of us are talking about 
various societal ills and how in a multidisciplinary way we can make a change. And so this is a movement and I'm so pleased that you are here talking about it because all of us have either seen it, that means domestic violence or violence, we've all seen it or been victimized by it or have had other, have seen others dear to us experience it as well. It's, it is singularly not something that is an, it is an equal opportunity ill, that's what it is, an equal opportunity ill. And so I appreciate the fact that we're talking about it because trauma is a terrible thing and these types of conversations nearly need to be, really truly need to be held. So I thank you for having me to do this today. I bring greetings, I appreciate what we're going to talk about because all of us must become both advocates and activists when it comes to these types of conversations. They have, we have to help move them from the conversation to the implementation. And so I appreciate your being here. I appreciate all of those of you who are online who are taking part of this from students. I looked on the, on the screen and it is not just criminal justice disciplines that are here. They're across the board from nursing to the sciences to all the behavioral and social sciences that are participating this morning. So I thank you for being here. That's also one of the beauties of virtuality, isn't it? That we can all tune in more easily. So thank you, Dr. Rice and all of the criminal justice, the fabulous criminal justice faculty and staff to all of our students who are gonna be making a big difference some of whom will have already started making those big differences. Enjoy your morning, enjoy your month, and uh, congratulations on National Criminal Justice Month. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dean O'Brien. And at this time, I would uh, like to uh, bring forth um, my uh, good colleague, uh, Ms. Katsura Karita, uh, who is the Title IX coordinator here at Coppin State University. And uh, Ms. Karita, she will say to you, uh, well, I'm kind of, you know, I'm new to Coppin, but from what I could see, uh, she's kind of jumped in and just demonstrated a uh, high level of knowledge that's been beneficial to faculty and staff and students, but also uh, compassion, uh, compassion uh, when it's needed. Uh, and also committed uh, to ensuring that we have a, a, a campus community and student life uh, that is one where people feel safe and there's also uh, accountability. Uh, so at this time, I'd like to bring forth my colleague, uh, Ms. Carita. Good morning. I'm so delighted to be here and I wanna thank Dr. Rice Dean O'Brien, and I look forward to hearing the presentation from our distinguished guest speaker, Ms. Katie Ray Jones. Again, my name is Katsura Karita, and I am the new Title IX coordinator at Coppin. My role is to ensure our campus environment is free from gender discrimination and harassment, that our policies and procedures are fair, equitable, and impartial, that the university provides support and resources for victims of sexual violence, and that we hold members of our campus community accountable when there are violations of policy. Since I started last September, I've been working hard to educate students and employees about sexual misconduct policies and procedures, reporting options, and supportive resources that are available both on and off campus. For me, it's important that individuals who have experienced sexual violence, as well as those who've been accused of sexual misconduct, feel supported, respected, and are treated with dignity. Another important aspect of my role is to offer prevention education and bystander intervention programs. Once students and employees understand what constitutes sexual harassment or sexual assault, or what consent really means in a sexual relationship, or 
how much alcohol is too much where a person is not able to give consent, then I hope that there will be more people who are seeking resources and support and more reports will be made um, in my office. In addition, we need to encourage more active bystander intervention from our peers to step in and speak up if we see situations where we can intervene safely by directly confronting the individual, distracting the person, calling a friend or the authorities to intervene, or just following up with the person after the incident to just to check in. Each of us can make a difference. So I encourage you to participate in the bystander intervention training that will be offered in Dedman Hall um, in the sixth floor lounge on March 17th at 7 p.m. We are also planning several programs and activities that focus on supporting survivors of sexual assault and on ending sexual violence during the month of April, which is Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month. So please stay tuned for all those events and activities and join us. Since I started in September, I have received eight reports um, from individuals who've experienced sexual assault or other forms of sexual violence. These reports are more than just names and faces. They remind me that there are individuals in our community who, are, who have been hurt and are struggling to maintain their daily routines and others who are finding their voice to stand up against interpersonal violence. No matter where a person may be on their journey of healing, I will listen, I will support, and I will help. I encourage anyone to reach out to me um, if they need any resources and information. My office is located in the physical education complex in room 224 above the fitness center. And there are many, many resources online on the Title IX website. Cop and cares, and you are not alone. Thank you so much for being here in person and online. I want to, uh, again, uh, thank Ms. Carita for all that she does for our, our campus community. At this time, I want to bring forth a young man, Sam Minsufu Bey. Sam is a member of the Criminal Justice Club. He's also an officer. And I have the pleasure of uh, teaching Sam in my victimology class. And so we have a lot of spirited debate and discussion. Uh, and he's someone who is continuing to grow as a student scholar here at the university. So at this time, could we give a round of applause to <laughs> Sam and Sufi Bay? <laughs> Uh, greetings. My name is Sam Sufu Bay, and I am a, a office member of the Coppin State Criminal Justice Club. And I would like to thank y'all for coming out today. On behalf of the Criminal Justice Club, I would like for y'all. Uh, I would thank. I'm thanking y'all for coming out today. We, the members of the Criminal Justice Club, seek to promote positive images of our organization by encart by encouraging criminal justice activities, community service projects, reliability, friendship, and love of our organization and people, and honoring Coppin State University and her rich heritage and history. We also pro seek to we also seek to become productive undergraduate and graduate students while we are here contributing alumni when we graduate. This event allows us to grow as student scholars and stand up against domestic violence and all forms of abuse. I thank you for coming out. Have a blessed evening. Thank you, uh, Sam. And again, uh, you know, I want to be uh, remiss if I didn't acknowledge also all of our uh, students. If our students are here, could you just stand up, please, real quick? Can we give a round of applause for our students? These are the next group of change makers uh, who are getting the, the, the education and the academic training and bringing their own unique lens uh, to our classrooms 
Uh, these are the difference makers. Some of them already work for organizations making an impact now. Uh, and so we look forward to what you'll do in the future. Thank you. Let me clap up one more time for them. At this time, it is uh, an honor to uh, introduce uh, our keynote, and I'm going to uh, read uh, the, the bio. You should each have a copy of the program and the bio at your respective uh, table. And, and then I'm going to share just real quick some general comments, and then we will have our keynote speaker come uh, to, to the podium. Uh, Katie Ray Jones is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Domestic Violence Hotline, where she provides the strategic vision and leadership for the only hotline in the nation that links victims and survivors to more than 4,500 shelters and domestic violence programs across the U.S., Puerto Rico, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. For more than a decade, Ms. Ray Jones has established herself as a leader in the domestic violence movement and has extensive experience working with victims and survivors. Prior to being named CEO of the Hotline, she served as president of the organization for three years. She was also the operations director where she transformed operations within the Hotline and National, National Dating Abuse Helpline, which is now known as Love is Respect. She's managed emergency shelter, transitional and permanent housing programs, non-residential services for survivors and their children, services for individuals with HIV AIDS and a therapeutic preschool for children who have witnessed violence. She's worked at a legal clinic that provided assistance to domestic violence victims seeking restraining orders, providing individual therapy and facilitated groups for survivors and abusers and work for the Texas Health and Human Services Commission, where she administered funding to family violence providers throughout the state. She's a member of the National Task Force to End Domestic and Sexual Violence, and she's well known on Capitol Hill for her work in domestic violence and was chosen by Congress to deliver testimony to the Labor, Health and Human Services Appropriation Committee. She also serves as the treasurer. She has served as past treasurer of the board for the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence, where I got to know and work with Katie well for over 10 years. And uh, she has her bachelor's degree in child and family uh, development from San Diego State University and a master's degree in nonprofit management and leadership from the University of San Diego. But I think most importantly, uh, she is family oriented. Uh, she's married and has three wonderful children, George, Maximilian, and Cooper. And let me just note that, um, you know, I've had the opportunity to uh, go to Texas and to visit the hotline and to witness firsthand the amazing and important work uh, that is, is carried out by patient, loving, compassionate people uh, on a daily basis. And Katie is someone who is uh, hard charging. Uh, she's someone who's the consummate professional, but she can also laugh in a field in which there is sadness. Uh, she has uh, been someone that I've admired based on the growth and the work that she's done to expand the hotline. So whenever you see these shows and they say call the National Domestic Violence Hotline, she's the point person for that. Right. Um, and so it's one thing when someone's doing great work, but it's another thing when you can call them a good friend. Uh, at this time, I'd like to bring to the podium uh, my good friend and CEO of the National Domestic Violence Hotline, Ms. Katie Ray Jones. <laughs> Clickers make me nervous, so bear with me. On this. Thank you, Dr. Rice. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien, for having me here and welcoming to Eagle Nation. I've not actually been here on campus before, so really excited to be here with you today. And due to the pandemic, I have not left Texas much. So if I 
grab and hug you desperately as you're trying to leave, I apologize. Human connection is something I've been missing during this time. Uh, so as Dr. Bryant said, I'm going to talk about a pretty depressing topic. Um, I'm not usually the folks that come to the party and people leave happy. I'm going to hopefully give you a few things to think about. Um, talking about advancing survivor-centered research, advocacy, and education, and the work that the hotline does to do that, and how we've really reframed our work as an organization to really be truly survivor-centered. So I want to say, we'll be talking about an intense topic. Um, as Dr. Rice and Dr. Bryant said, this issue may be really close to you. It may trigger you. Please take good care of yourself. Step away if you need to. Um, I will be here after if you need to process anything. While I don't plan on telling any stories at any moment, I may digress and launch into some story. I've been doing this work a long time. And when I talk about this issue, so many people come to mind that I helped get into shelter or get a restraining order. And so I always feel like when I talk about this and we talk about the statistics, it's important to remember there are people behind those numbers. There are human beings who have families. And even when we talk about the person choosing to cause harm, they're usually coming from a place of trauma as well. So you'll see our mission as an organization is to shift power back. Domestic violence is rooted in power and control. And what we're hoping to do when we connect with a survivor is to be able to talk about the power that is still within them and how to regain and claim some of that power back. Sometimes that is picking up the phone or entering to a chat with an advocate. It doesn't mean picking up all of their belongings and leaving the home that day. And our vision is really to work ourselves out of a job. We want to create a world in which all relationships are positive, healthy, and free from violence. And then here we go, our history. Uh, we were created in 1996 by the original Violence Against Women's Act, which interestingly, last night, the omnibus was posted and the Violence Against Women Act is attached to that. It has expired, so fingers crossed. Dr. Rice, hopefully we see this cross the finish line. It's an important piece of legislation that I'll talk about a little bit more later, but it did create the, the hotline back in 1996. And we were really fortunate at the time that there were really phenomenal leaders who worked with then Senator Biden to say there needs to be a national hotline where a victim can call, get connected to that local program. And over time, what we found when we really truly listened to survivors is that this was often the first time they were telling anyone what was happening in their home. And it felt very abrupt to connect them to that local program and not do an assessment and not talk about safety planning or what was happening in their relationship. The flip side of that is we weren't assessing, so we were referring it appropriately at the same time. So we wanted to correct that and we've revised our model over time to really be a place to listen, support, and help. I love what you said. It was like spot on on advocacy. It really is a place where we hope to give hope to the hopeless. Many of our contacts reach out and say, how do I get them to stop hurting me? What am I doing wrong? Um, how do I you know, change and be the person they want me to be? So we do a lot of education about the relationship and, and shifting that responsibility back to the person who is choosing, and that's an intentional word, choosing to cause harm. We started Love is Respect. I had to put my glasses on. I'm like, I'm getting old now. I gotta wear glasses. Um, in, an, in response to a lot of young people who were calling the hotline and asking questions about the relationship, 13, 14 years old, saying, my boyfriend didn't talk to me at school today. What does that mean? Uh, my girlfriend's telling me I can't talk to other girls. What should I do with that? So we launched Love is Respect as a healthy relationship platform in an effort to educate young people about what the components of a healthy relationship are so we can hopefully prevent domestic violence. It talks a little bit about our services here. Um, I mentioned we do a lot of safety planning education and the most important, beautiful part is to make that connection to the local program in someone's local community, to be the short-term resource to a long-term solution. It worked. So sometimes you might think of a hotline, you might picture a small building, a couple people answering phones. We're a very busy hotline, unfortunately, due to the pervasive nature of domestic violence. In calendar year 2021, we answered 400, over 408,000 contacts. 
we had almost over 650,000 that actually came into the organization. That is a lot of individuals reaching out to a confidential resource to talk about what's happening either to them themselves or to someone they care about, which is our second highest contact type. Family, friends, neighbors, coworkers, roommates. What you'll see, I wanna just give this to bring it home here. Of those contact, a little over 3,500 came from the state of Maryland with 802 of them coming from Baltimore. Maryland ranks 17th in terms of contacts answered for the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Significant given the size of the state. On December 30th, uh, we actu actually answered our 6 millionth contact. I've been with the organization for 13 years. Every time we hit that next millionth is taking less and less time just due to the sheer volume. When I started with the organization, we would see anywhere from 500 contacts today, a day, and now it's upwards 2,000. Uh, just due to awareness, as you all know, you see it in the media. We talk more today about the complexities that exist and the intersectionality that exists with domestic violence and every single social justice issue. There's a little bit here around of the types of abuse. And so while when we do this data collection that's driving, this is self-reported. We don't wanna feel like a telemarketing call and go through a list of data fields. This is the survivor describing their situation to an advocate, either phone, chat, or texting, and then us capturing that data. So best guess is a lot of this is actually underreported. A lot of survivors do not categorize a lot of the abuse that's happening in their relationship as abuse. So you see 96% of emotional abuse and 61% physical abuse. These next three that you see around economic, digital, and sexual abuse in intimate partner relationships, that's often not labeled violence or abuse. So economic and financial abuse, research being done has actually shown 98% of abusive relationships experience economic and financial abuse. Oftentimes, I'm sure I thought it when I was younger, why doesn't she just leave the relationship? The better question is why are they choosing to cause harm? That's how we're gonna stop the violence. But also because of the complexity, if you think about someone who's in a relationship and their partner has ruined their credit, racked up a lot of debt in their name, went to their job and harassed them and they lost their, their job because of their partner showing up. It's real hard to find an apartment when you have bad credit. There's a wait list for shelters most of the time. Most shelters might only be 30 days. You better have a strong game plan because they're gonna be finding another place to go pretty soon. And the lack of transitional affordable housing makes it really difficult for survivors to leave that relationship and land on their feet. Digital abuse is really a new space as we think about technology and how people who choose to cause harm want to infiltrate the digital space of the person that they're harming. They want their passwords. They're encouraging them to send pictures of sexting. I'm so not hip. Teens are telling me all the time what the language is these days. So if I'm off key, I'm old lady. Um, there really is a space where we're doing a lot of education about what's happening and social media digitally and the safety issues that come up with that to really hopefully interrupt some of the things that are happening. Nothing's more heartbreaking than a you know, young person who calls us and says, I sent pictures to my partner. They're showing them to everyone at school. What do I do? We talk about healing. That's what we need to do because it's a really hard space. And oftentimes there's not a legal ramification for that. And then sexual abuse. Oftentimes, rape happens in intimate partner relationships, uh, reproductive coercion, birth control being tampered with, forcing someone to get pregnant or to have an abortion. These are the types of stories that don't often come up when they call first and present with that kind of information. So sexual abuse, people think, well, you know, it's my partner's right to ask me to have sex with them. It's my partner's right to tell me like they wanna have a baby or not. So we're talking again, a lot about shifting that power and control back to the person experiencing the abuse. Oh, I did it. See, I put, pointed at the wrong screen. 
Uh, love is respect. So I mentioned this is our healthy relationship platform. We also just launched a national youth council. Uh, we, we periodically open it up because we're growing a movement of young people across the country that are between the ages of 15 and 24. Some of you fall into that age range. Please check out our website. We're, we're really feeling like, as Dr. O'Brien said, to change what's happening in our country around domestic violence, it's gonna be you all that make it happen. It's gonna be you all who interrupt it and tell your friends, your family members, they deserve better, they deserve dignity, they deserve respect, there's hope for them, there's another option for them. It's gonna take you all to reshape how we define relationships and that everybody deserves to be treated fairly. You'll see some of the statistics here around what we're, what we're seeing. So I'm gonna show this next slide just to talk about some of the very specific statistics. I think I've, I've done it again, I'm frozen. And now I went too far. There we go. Um, so I remember this, I told you I wasn't gonna tell a story and here I go. Um, when my husband and I were living in San Diego and we were in a really large apartment complex and we woke up in the middle of the night to screaming and we could actually hear someone hitting someone else. So my husband is a big guy. He's like, I'm going out there. And I was like, whoa, like, we don't know if there's weapons happening. We don't know the situation. And he was like, I'm going. So he left and I looked out the window and the balconies of the apartment complex that all faced in towards this courtyard were filled with people watching. I called 911. I was the only 911 call, the only one. By the time my husband had gotten around the corner, um, the person who was causing the abuse had barricaded himself and his girlfriend inside the apartment. So my husband waited while the police arrived. But I still go back to that moment. How could I be the only 911 call? Now, I will say that today, calling 911 may not be what every survivor wants. But in this, ish, this situation, we were fearful of her life. Um, she was in really bad shape by the time the police were able to get in there and get him out. My husband used to say, he grew up in an abusive home himself, that nobody talked about it. It was our private business. And here was a man as an adult who chose to do something different and could have possibly saved this woman's life. It's not a private issue. Dr. O'Brien said it too. I'm gonna to quote you all day, Dr. O'Brien. It is a public health crisis. We have to, this issue impacts women. It's the number one cause women go to the emergency room. It's the number one cause of death for black women. It is significantly impacting us as a community, as a nation across the world. So here are the statistics. One in four women, one in seven men have been the victim of severe physical violence in their lifetime. Teens are reporting at one in three. We got to get in front of this, right? Like this is a significant problem. So if we look at this room here, there are survivors in this room. Statistically, it's impossible. I'm one of them. So we've got to be in a place to say, if, if you're moving about the world and you're like, I don't know anyone who's a survivor, most likely they're suffering in silence. And how many times have we watched the news and they're reporting a homicide and the neighbor comes out and said, I knew something was wrong. Something didn't feel right. This is a place where we can offer compassionate support and get people connected to a resource that can really engage in deep advocacy. Victims of intimate partner violence lose a total of 8 million days of paid work each year. That's incredible. So sometimes when I'm going out and talking to corporations about engaging in doing domestic violence work, and they're like, we don't have that problem. That doesn't exist here. I look at you, Dr. Rice, because you know this story. And it's like, you, well, if it's not from an employee perspective, it's certainly impacting your bottom line. So how are you going to support your employees? And sometimes that's when corporations will be like, okay, let's do training. Because it is impacting the business if we can't get to the side of when your employees feel safe and cared for, they're better employees. They're more productive. 
they're going to value you as an employer. You're probably going to retain them as an employer longer. I told you I'm not the life of the party most times when I go places. So domestic violence, the numbers we talked about, you know, it doesn't dis discriminate by any means, but there are some certain statistics of how it's impacting specific communities on the margins. So if we look at four and five American Indian and Alaska Native women have experienced violence in their lifetime, that's depressing. Um, I, we do, we helped launch Strong Hearts, which is a helpline for the Native community. And we worked with them for a few years and then they became independent from us. And their staff, who are all Native, said when they were on tribal land, it wasn't a question of if they were gonna be a victim, it was when. And that's a really challenging place. So you'll see like as we work on policy and the needs of survivors, there's a lot of work in going into supporting tribal communities. Tribal jurisdiction, that's a whole nother presentation. It's a really frustrating place that when someone on tribal land actually reaches out to law enforcement, there's jurisdictional issues. If that person who assaulted, the person who's a member of the tribe is not from the tribe, it's not tribal jurisdiction. And so what could happen is it could take weeks before law enforcement actually gets to the scene. And by then the entire scene has been contaminated because the families walked through and they lose evidence. So a lot of uh, criminal justice responses, particularly on native land, it's very complicated. And we're trying to do a lot of work to ensure that native women, American Indian women have the resources they need. You'll see 40% of black women will experience IPV in their lifetime. And one difference between black women and white women is that black women will usually experience higher levels of homicide um, in those interactions and relationships. One in three Latinas will experience IPV and one in 12 has experienced IPV in the last 12 months. Now, when I click, you're just clicking it. I think I'm doing it. <laughs> okay. So COVID, this was like the perfect storm for domestic violence survivors because they were trapped in the home with the person who was causing them harm. With no way out, we received calls from people who had actually called 911 and 911 said, that's going to be a misdemeanor. Sorry, we can't respond. Can't take them to jail. We are under certain protocols. We had women who were strangled by their partner and were afraid to go to the hospital because they feared that they would be infected with COVID. So we would stay on the phone with women at night, making sure they could still speak, that they weren't losing their ability to breathe. And if they got into that situation, then we knew that they were in the hospital parking lot. These are dire situations. I used to always say, why does the survivor have to leave the home? How do we get the person causing the harm to leave the home? It disrupts so much of the family life for the person who's being victimized. We see the stress of economic losses, a lot of places around employment and financial stability. Had a woman I spoke with who was saving money to leave. So people often think the number one reason people call the hotline is they want to go to shelter. It's not. They want a legal advocate. They want someone who can help them navigate divorce, restraining orders, custody issues. And so this woman was saving money to be able to leave. She did hair. She was stashing it in a secret place in the house, about $2,000. He found it, took it, and went and spent it, gambled it away. So she was starting back at square one. We heard stimulus tech. Stimulus checks were being stolen by the partners, not access to that financial independence. So when we talk about survivor-driven policy, survivors want direct cash assistance. That's what they need. They need the ability to go get the apartment. They need the ability, so this is, let me go my soapbox a moment, got into a discussion. I was been in the Hill yesterday, meeting with government agencies around direct cash assistance. And the space around we want to hold survivors accountable to how they're using money. But you have a scenario, if a survivor wanted to use direct cash assistance and bought new tires for the person who was causing her harm, his car, how would you feel about it? I'm like, that was, what? She can't do that. What if that is the car that gets him to work to pay the bills to put food on the table for the kids. It should be her choice, right? It should be 
his choice because males are also survivors. Um, so the, it's really shaping and changing the way we think about the needs of survivors. When I started in this field 25 years ago, I remember taking a class in, in, at San Diego State, and it was like this toolbox of you're going to meet with someone, you want them to get the restraining order, you want to get them to shelter, make sure they go to the clinic, make sure they get the kids in school, and there was like this checklist. And then I remember working in the shelter and there were all these rules, like the bed had to be made and curfew and they couldn't drink in the shelter. And I was like, I don't think I could live here. I don't think my mom could live here or my aunt. Like this is not a place where, are we really setting people up for success? And then what are trauma-informed services? I remember so many families coming into shelter and being tired. They were tired. They needed three days just to sleep and rest. And if I'm not making my bed at home, why does anyone in the shelter need to make their bed at home? And you might think I'm messy, but I don't make my bed at home. So there's just a space of like, how do we rethink services from where we started to where we are today? And this is what survivors are telling us to be able to change and shape that picture. So we talk about the complexities and why does someone stay in that relationship? This is a pretty good list right here. And what I always like to say is never underestimate the fear that's present in the relationship. People think, oh, well, if they leave, then they're gonna be safe. When someone leaves a relationship, it is the most dangerous time in the relationship. The chance of lethality increases by 75%. A lot of stories we hear is when someone left the relationship, they got the restraining order, they were in shelter, the partner found them, killed them, and sometimes kills the kids. So we never want to take that for granted. When someone's leaving, it needs to be thoughtful, you need to be planning, and safety planning is not a cookie cutter approach. It looks different for everybody. They often say they're staying for the children's safety and well-being. Living in a shelter is hard. I just told you what it looks like, and. We had a pretty nice shelter. When I worked for the Texas Health and Human Services Commission, I toured shelters where it's communal living, there are cockroaches, there's mice, there's places where the kids are saying, I'd rather go live with dad. Like, take me back where I had a home or I didn't have to share a room, didn't have to share food. It can be a really challenging place. So their safety and well-being. I also find it's also the number one reason people finally leave is for the kids. When they begin to see, I, this woman, when she came into shelter one time and she had this two, two year old boy and they were walking down the stairs and she turned back and she's like, let's go. And he says, F you. And she was like, he sounded just like my husband when he said that. And that's the space where as parents, mothers, fathers, they begin to see some of the behaviors in the relationship when they think the kids are sleeping, they're not sleeping. Um, they're hearing what's going on. And so doing a lot of education about the impact on kids is really, really key for survivors to know. Um, the lack of support from others. We talked about helping. It's really easy to place judgment. It's frustrating. Being that support person is hard. The average person leaves almost seven times before they finally leave for good. So the family friends who call us, like, I'm just going to do tough love. I'm, love, I'm cutting her off. That is an abusive partner's dream, isolation, to have the survivor without friends, family. So we wanna interrupt that space and make sure that the survivor already know, always knows that he or she has someone they can turn to for a non-judgmental space. We talked about lack of resources, the feelings of guilt or shame, often internalizing what's happening in the relationship as being their fault, their dependence on their partner, and that's strategic. Listen, most relationships start out like, doesn't the sky just seem bluer and you got a little more pep in your step and you just feel good all the time? People are like, why are you smiling so much? Abusive relationships start out that same way. And it slowly comes into a place where there's some emotional abuse that happens. It doesn't often start with a punch. There's a lot of work that happens strategically on the person choosing to cause harm around isolating that person, disguising that as love. Don't go out with your friends tonight. 
I love you so much. I want to be with you. And then, okay, I'm going to stay with you tonight. And then, oh, don't wear that out. You look too good in that. Just wear sweatpants. And then you, you see this and people, you know, their clothing changes, their mood changes over time. This is the perfect time to start asking questions. Are you okay? I'm here for you. Simple things. You don't need to do an intervention, be the advocate, get them to shelter. You can turn that over to the hotline or love is respect. And then finally, this place of love. This is always the hardest one I think people struggle with. How do they still love that person? Because they're not the abusive person all the time. They see pieces of the person they fell in love with throughout the relationship. And it is the ultimate mind trip for survivors to, this is the person I love. How could I fall in love with someone like this? Well, there they are. Who's this person? It keeps people on their toes and and a really feeling of hypervigilance all the time in the relationship. So Survivors Center Policy, we are headquartered in Austin, Texas. I think I've almost made it through here without saying y'all. I'm not originally a Texan, but I picked that up real quick. I don't know how that happened. Um, but we do have a small policy office here in DC. And it came about because there were people in the field, like Dr. Rice, who were engaging with the hotline. And they said, you are collecting an incredible amount of data that would be really impactful for members of Congress to hear. I don't even know what that looks like. Like I'm not a data person, therapist, program person, but we did it. And it's been the, the first hearing on the Hill around firearms that was not about firearms and domestic violence. And it wasn't about the hotline was used by uh, the gun control folks. They used our data to secure the first hearing on the Hill. It was incredible. We didn't get credit. We didn't want credit. But to have a panel on gun control in this country by Congress was unheard of. Um, and you know, as a Texan, which is a gun-loving state, um, it was an amazing moment, even for our members of Congress. So we want to leverage our data to really talk about survivor experiences and the needs from the lines. We are on the cusp of releasing a law enforcement survey that talks about survivors' experiences with law enforcement. We did this probably about seven, eight years ago. I thought the results would change drastically given the social justice, racial justice conversations in our country. Not too much difference, but what we found is that 92% of respondents wanted options other than law enforcement. They want law enforcement there in their toolbox, but they want other options as well. They wanted access to cash assistance, healthcare, legal services, a network of community support that could help them break through, free from that relationship. And then we're gonna amplify our research and policy solutions that center the needs of the most marginalized survivors. So this is now where we're dicing and pulling out specific demographics for communities of color, the LGBTQ community. Um, we're looking at things that around gender and what does that look like in terms of being a survivor and lifting that up. This is, you know, the issue of domestic violence years was nonpartisan. I mean, Johnny, you know this too. We would go and VAWA would get sponsors from both sides, wasn't a heavy lift, the Family Violence Prevention Services Act, easy peasy, and now it's become partisan. Uh, we move in a space where we are constantly arguing for services for communities on the margins and why we need that language in there, why we need specific funding for specific populations. And VAWA almost didn't make it out there last night. It was a nail biter. I was up until I think 2.30 when, when the bill posted and it's in there. We had to make some compromises, but we, I think it's a, it's a pretty good bill compared to where we've been in previous years. And then we wanna ground our policy priorities in our organizational values as being survivor-centered, anti-racist organization. So this is an evolving process for us. Obviously, I'm a white woman leading a mainstream organization, but because of the ability we have around our data to share to other social justice organizations, we wanna lift up those organizations' work as best as we can to make sure we're creating a network of services that really means something to survivors. And then here's the two bills that I just mentioned that we're really pushing through. These two bills support the network of services uh, criminal justice support as well through the Violence Against Women's Act, training for law enforcement officers, legal advocacy, like the services don't exist without these two bills. 
Now, what is sad, like now that we're in the midst of a war, um, what was hopefully going to be a bill introduced last night that had about $200 million increases for domestic violence services. I mentioned the wait list that happens. It's an overburdened, under-resourced system, always has been. What we know now with increased awareness, more people need to access the services. And we're saying, it's great you want to leave. We have a six-month wait list. That's a problem. So the bill gets introduced. We thought it was going to be a $200 million increase. It was $17 million, which by the time it goes to every state, down to local programs, they're not going to see or feel it. So if you think about you know, your career, what's possible, advocate and activism, those are the two words that really need to shape what's happening. Congress sees me all the time. I'm pretty sure when they walk in, they're like, here she comes. She's going to say what she feels she needs to say because the money pays her paycheck. But the reality is you all have a voice here and they listen. So if you're ever interested, um, Johnny, I'll make sure people know how to get a hold of me. Please let us know. We would be happy to have you work with our policy team, do visits. If you want to talk about your experience, that is how we make the change happen. Uh, members of Congress do when we bring in a guest. That's usually when the actual member may show up versus us talking to the staffer who's going to take a lot of notes. So there's a lot of ability to create change here. So there's contact information for the hotline and love is respect. That's not how you'll get to me, um, but Dr. Rice will be able to give that to you if you're interested in, in doing some policy work here, internships. We have a lot of opportunities. Uh, we're about to branch out now. Uh, we're opening other locations for advocates across the country. So we'll be hiring. Uh, I think we, we need to hire like 50 more people here shortly due to increased resources. So we're excited to do that. But please follow us on social media. Stay, stay connected, stay informed. When your gut tells you something doesn't seem right or feel right, your gut's usually right. Thank you. So can we give one more round of applause to our guest, Katie Ray Jones? And there were a, a, a lot of, of, of nuggets, you know, so interesting because great minds think alike. As soon as I, I heard uh, Ms. Ray Jones discuss, you know, the DC office, in my mind immediately the thought of interns uh, came up and I was like, oh, you know, we have to get you involved in our intern list. And so we're going to make sure. Dean O'Brien, before you leave, can we take a picture real quick? Just, Katie, you want to come up? We have a uh, a swag bag. Would we want to we want to give you come on up? I want to thank Miss Robertson from my office or our office, Team CJ's office, for helping to put it together. And let me just say this, the swag bag, I'm handing you some of these items here. If I can oh, get wow, it. Wow, I'm so excited. That I always love a good hat. Yeah. <laughs> and we have the little eagle right there. All right. I want to give this to you. Thank you for Thank you. visiting our campus and, and coming and sharing with us. And, and again, let me just say, you know, it's when you put together a swag bag and you want to keep the swag bag, oh, there's some nice things <laughs> you, yeah. you want you want to keep it. Right So to our um, our students who are here and who are also watching online, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities. And of course, please reach out to me. 
I'm definitely going to ensure that we develop a relationship with the hotline uh, so that internship opportunities through criminal justice as well as other related majors uh, can happen, right? Uh, and I think that um, it's, again, a way for us to make uh, an impact. At this juncture, we're going to do a brief Q&A. Uh, we do have a microphone set up on both sides. And if you have any particular questions uh, for Ms. Ray Jones based on what she shared or just in domestic violence in general, um, please feel comfortable to come up and, and ask your question. And I will start us off. I do have a, a, a question. Uh, it's in reference to, I'm, I'm curious, uh, Katie, in terms of the transition, because, you know, you think of the phone, you know, when, when with, with the hotline, you know, initially I would always think of the phone. How did you move into the, the, the technological space in terms of chat? And you had mentioned some other ways of, of communication. How, how, what moved you to get into that space? And how has that been, that, that process? So I think one of the most humblest things I've learned as a leader is to listen mm -hmm. uh, to ideas that seem out of the box. So for chat, we actually had two of our colleagues in the organization who had gone to a technology conference and came back with a plan on cocktail nap napkins. And that we need to offer services via chat. It's like, I am a trained therapist. What person would want to engage over their most intimate details in the coldest way? And they left and I went home. I was like, what are you doing? Probably everybody, but you. So went back to the office the next day and I said, I, let's try it. And the day we launched, a college student chatted and a news, local news station covered it. And she said, this is the most private way I can communicate about what's happening in my relationship without my roommate hearing, my friends hearing, because her shame was so deep around the relationship, she wanted a digital barrier. Interestingly, on digital services, we hear more about the sexual abuse that's happening than we do on the phone because of that added layer of anonymity. I can't hear your voice. I can't hear that you're crying. It's just a little bit more removed. So it's been one of the best things we've done, uh, we went and added text a couple years later, and those two platforms are growing faster than phones. I mean, we don't even order pizza over the phone anymore. People don't want services that way either. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Any, uh, any questions? Ms. Taylor, you want to come up to the microphone? First of all, oh, I can't take this off. Yeah, thank yeah. you for coming. First of all, Second, you want to speak into the mic. Secondly, you were talking, you had mentioned something in reference to somebody had called and said their boyfriend was took some pictures and was showing it to everybody. What was the answer for that to her? So, first, we did a lot of validation, just really sat in a space to name the feelings that she was feeling. Jurisdictions differ if there might be a criminal justice response. So we'll always ask the survivor, what, what do you want to do? She was a student in high school. We talked about, are you comfortable talking to administration? She didn't want to do that. We want to make sure everything's survivor driven. She just really wanted a space to cry and talk through what was happening. Um, we gave her some tips like, hey, you could tell your friends to contact Love is Respect and get some guidance on how to communicate with you and engage in a non-judgmental way. Because what she was hearing from her friends was, why would you do that? That was so stupid. I can't believe, you. why would you trust him? And so that was worse for her. Uh, she really needed a, just a safe space to process. And we did talk about emotional safety planning for her. How is she gonna self-care during this time? That's always important. 
And then we talked about ways that if she wanted to gauge the school where they might be able to put him in different classes, because that's another thing that we've seen in the beginning, the victim was historically forced to move classes. So we've done a lot of work around Title IX, educating peer review panels, make the person causing harm change classes, not the survivor. But there's a lot of situations around the complexities where as advocates, it's real. I can't, I can't promise you if you go to court, you're gonna get custody of your kids. No matter the horrific things that your partner's done. So there is a lot of space where around emotional safety planning, the physical safety planning, making sure there's still hope. Don't give up. Fight as much as you can. Let's get you the resources. But it can be really difficult, which is why we have a really robust wellness program for our advocates, because they're experiencing trauma eight hours a day, contact after contact, and there's a minute and a half between every call. Thank you. I have one more question, actually. Yeah. You had mentioned something about a girl said that her boyfriend told her that she could not talk to other boys. That's a part of control, isn't it? How do you get out of that? How do you deal with that? So jealousy is a natural emotion, but it's unhealthy emotion. And what you do with jelly, jealousy is how you decide, are you in a healthy, unhealthy, or an abusive relationship? In a healthy relationship, you can talk to anyone mm -hmm. without fear of retaliation from your partner. You, so I always, like when I train, I also say like, hey, when you go home, you're probably going to think you're in an abusive relationship. I'm going to tell you, you should be arguing, right? You're two people in a relationship. You're going to have differences of opinion. It's healthy to argue. But if you're arguing and you feel fear, intimidation, you feel like you can't say what you want, you can't be who you want, we're in unhealthy abusive behaviors. It is a form of control if you're wanting to talk to someone and your partner saying you can't, we would be concerned. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you. You can clap it up for it. Some great questions. Anyone else before we start to transition out? We do have a question in the okay, chat great. from Dr. Pearl. Great presentation. Can you share the resources that are available for male victims of domestic violence? You mentioned that one in seven report. Although the margin is small, how do we support the men who suffer in silence? It's a great question. And that one in seven is most definitely underreported due to stigma, stigma and shame that male identified survivors feel. I think there's been a lot of progress in this space and Dr. Rice has led some of these spaces around male survivor work. You know, 25 years ago, if a male called a program, they would say, you're probably the perpetrator and not access services. A lot of programs didn't accept men. We've definitely made a lot of strides that way. I think the best place for a male survivor to start is with the National Domestic Violence Hotline. Because what we do to connect to the local program and resources is we make the call on behalf of the survivor. So if we hear something and it's happened uh, where the program seems to be in a space where they're questioning whether this is really the survivor or the abusive partner, we can travel in that space to do the advocacy or refer them to another program first and then not have the male survivor experience additional trauma. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, at this juncture, a uh, couple of things I do want to note again. I want to thank um, uh, Ms. Ray Jones for coming to our, our campus. Yes, I see a hand in the back. Is that another question? Yes. Yes, Dr. Bolton. I just have two brief questions. Step back a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, how often does forgiveness factor into um, the work that you do, and to whom is the forgiveness mainly directed? And the second one is how often do you address the lessons um, learned from childhood? 
Great questions. I'll try to be brief because those are complicated ones. Um, so the issue of forgiveness comes up a lot. I mentioned on average, someone goes back and forth almost seven times before they, they leave the relationship for good. Forgiveness is a big part of that. Um, so there's a lot of, there's a space of forgive and forget. The person who's causing the harm will often say, I'm sorry, not going to do it again. I've changed. And the relationship goes back and it's often okay in the beginning until it reverts back to the abusive behaviors. So forgive and forget is a lot. And, and what happens on that from the victim side, survivor side, it presents to an advocate as I was so stupid. So we're really reinforcing and validating this is not your fault. It's common for this to happen, normalizing that so that they can really lift themselves up out of the shame and guilt that they're feeling. And then the childhood trauma piece, so 5% of our contacts that come into the organization are actually the person who identifies as the abusive partner. And that's why it's in the beginning. It's easy to paint the person causing the harm as a big, scary monster. They've often had so much trauma in their childhood, they just haven't had a place to process that. A lot of the batters intervention programs across the country are court ordered, um, nominal success. And this is, I think, the new space for domestic violence services. How are we going to create services where someone can contact and say, this doesn't really feel right? So we're seeing this in a younger population who watches reality TV and then the hotline number pops up or love is respect pops up. We actually have a lot of young people who watch that and say, uh, I was the person who picked up the phone and slammed it against the wall. What does that make me? And what do I do? So we want to be careful not to label people. I think there's this, I believe people can change. I wouldn't do this work if I didn't. And if someone wants to do the work and wants to change and learn the skills to do that, we got to open the doors and, and address the trauma. Thank you. Right here. Really quickly. Thank you. Um, in the aspect of code of ethics, what does that look like uh, in the field of this? Like a codependence? Yeah. Yeah. So there is a space where, you know, the person causing the harm really creates an environment where the survivor is dependent on them. Mm -hmm. So the intricacies of that could be financial, reproductive. Um, we've done so many focus surveys right now, even around substance abuse and mental health where abusive partners take medications from the partner, gaslighting happens, the survivor feels like they're crazy and they can't live without the partner. The partner really chips away their self-esteem. And most survivors will say, I don't deserve any better. Mm -hmm. So we're creating a narrative to say, you do, absolutely. You can be independent. And what are those steps gonna look like? The challenge with the codependency is what are the baby steps we can create that don't feel unachievable? And so what, like, in some ways we're saying in a call contact, how about you close the door and take a long shower today, longer than you would to get some time for yourself? Can you go for a walk? Like, those are the baby steps where the survivors feeling like they're making choices for themselves and getting a little bit of control back over their life. It's a journey. One of the most powerful thank you letters we ever got as an organization was from a woman who had been calling the organization for nine years, wrote a note and said, you never gave up on me. I left tonight with my daughter and a suitcase and my, I, I still cry, it's been five years since I received this letter. Mm. Nine years was her journey. You can't give up. And it was little, she talked about the little steps she took along the way before she could be ready to go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I want to thank you all uh, for your uh, questions. And as we start to move towards the close, there's a couple of things I do want to uh, make sure I, uh, I address. Uh, one, I want to thank uh, Team CJ, uh, my colleagues, faculty, and staff in the Department of Criminal Justice in the College of Behavioral Social Sciences for their uh, ongoing uh, support and contribution to this event. Can we clap it up for them? 
also want to thank uh, my colleagues and as well as students who represent criminal justice uh, and all other majors across the campus. Uh, we're glad that you are here uh, and that you are attentive and, and that you want to make a difference. So can we clap it up for them as well? And when you see events like this happen, uh, there's a lot of sweat equity that goes into it. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ms. Robertson, my admin. I want to thank Ms. Page, Mr. Ramos for assisting us in getting uh, this venue, as well as making sure that the venue was set uh, in, in, a, in a great way. I want to thank uh, Kelly and Ron, who uh, manage our IT and make sure that this could be streamed and shared even beyond the campus. And I also want to uh, recognize Andrew Brzezinski for his help uh, in developing uh, the uh, materials that we sent out to uh, promote this event. Can we clap it up for all of them? <laughs> At this time, I want to ask uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Earl Sebastian Bolden, to come up to uh, the podium. And Dr. Bolden is kind of our laureate here at uh, Coppin. Uh, he often sends words, be it in person or uh, via online or email, uh, providing commentary and, and, and just, just some inspiration uh, at times when things are great, but also at times when staff, faculty, and students need some uplifting. And so when I reached out to him to uh, provide some remarks, uh, for this uh, for this event, uh, he was readily willing and 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 ready to do it. Uh, and so at this time, I would like to bring up Dr. Earl Sebastian Bolden uh, with the charge: uh, What we can do, Dr. Bolden. I always remember that Kelly tells me that my voice projects. So Kelly, I'm moving the mic away from my mouth, so if I get a little passionate that it would not be overpowering. I heard you ask, what can we do? Stumped. It's not a feeling we much like, but what can we do when little or nothing seems to work? and helplessness feels like failure too. What can we do? But indeed, what can we do when changes, what can we do when nothing changes or unchanging path, when all around us seeds chaos and wrath and grief alone binds us to another broken soul longing for relief? when all life reminds us of looming tombstones instead of stepping stones to brighter, better future? What can we do when the single rose of sunshine is our only sign of hope? In this season of much disrepair, what can we do? What we can do is turn the tide to navigate the sea of pain and sunken dreams. What can we do? Reach inward to our souls, stretch outward to the history books, seek lessons from our present, find teachings from our past, discover what it took to stem the tide and not simply die. Look at data, understand the trend, listen to what they tell us, of what surround the bend. Interview the unsung broken soul, embrace the story yet untold, see with new sights the present, believe the future, yet not lost. So my refrain remains the same, we do what we can do, we do what we must do. Invest in those who never saw the road out of their sadness and dismay. Invest in those who need a chance to show they too can grow. Invest in those who have no voice, who never knew they had a choice. Be the eagle who comes to know power in unfurled wings. Glory, 
that soaring brings. Rescue the mother afraid to leave, fearing she will be left to grieve. Convinced to stay, not seeking her own better way, but now she stands as a survivor. Stand against all violence, break the tyranny of sickly silence, fight those who think their gun grants them some God-given license to shoot for fun. Teach them something more than strife, like love, respect, and the value of life. Make space so no life is a waste. Let them see you growing tall. Stand, be counted, speak your truth. Become someone someone else can call. Change first yours, then other people's thinking. Shine beacons of light to stop just one soul from sinking. To so the question, what can we do? I say the answer starts with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bolden. As Dr. Bolden said, the answer starts with you. It starts with us. I want to again thank Ms. Katie Ray Jones for her keynote. Note that whenever you are in the area, feel free to drop in on us. You know, the Eagle Nation and the Coppin family. Um, we look forward to partnering and collaborating uh, when and where possible. So thank you again. This brings to a conclusion uh, our first event for National Criminal Justice Month. I thank all the participants as well as attendees in person and online. Have a great remainder of your day. Thank you. <laughs>